So VUCA, anybody heard the term VUCA? No? Yeah. Okay, so the older generation have heard of VUCA. So this is what we decided is, it's VUCA. So if we're thinking about complexity, we're all in a complex adaptive system, and how do we know we are? Think about the impact that COVID had. We were all in our own cultural systems, all of a sudden, punctuated equilibrium for the theoretical term. Something came into that system and everything else had to adapt around it. So that's the key tenets of complexity. It has something that emerges and everything else has to adapt around it. When you get to having kids, you'll understand what that means. Okay, so then if we start thinking about this, about trust, how, how do we, I want some interaction here, how do you build up trust in your friendships? What are the key things that you lends you to trust someone and then to become a friend. Anyone want to shout out things? Honesty? Loyalty? Loyalty. Confidentiality? Confidentiality. Confidentiality. Right, so knowing you can trust people no matter what situation, so they've got your back, right? In sort of terms. But how do we do that with, with the guy over there? The nice electronic face, okay, scary AI person. Ooh, got a black thing. Um, because this is a theoretical model for trust. That they have the ability, the benevolence, the integrity, and the predictability, like you say. Whatever context we go in, you can predict that that person will have your back. They have the ability to know and understand you and know what you like and what you dislike and therefore they've got your best interests. Interests will come back to. And the integrity, not to reveal and go around, you know what Karen was doing in this presentation? You know, I'm sorry, rubbish, you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, it's lovely, Karen, really well done. You know, that sort of thing. And then if we try and flip it into the technological sphere, that's something entirely different. What was mentioned in the last speech, can we have transparency? AI. Well, Trish is in the audience over there as an expert in that, if you want to speak to her. But we've been working together because that is not actually physically possible right now. Anyone computer scientist in the audience? We've got one. Any more? No. Okay. It's not taught on computer science to look at the human concepts of trust and ethics that were mentioned. Now, ethics is a whole philosophical Aristotle thing. You don't need to be that. You just need to think about the consequences of what we're building and what it's doing. And we've seen this morning graphic representations of what happens in journalism when those things can go slightly wrong or, as I know from research, bots can actually then take that information and change it, no matter what the journalists have done. So when we look at what is trustworthiness, I think somebody put it in the question in the session, but what is trustworthiness in technology? It's very different from human trust. Basically, it's a list of parameters that the engineer will tick off and go, yeah, that's within acceptance. We've got a parameter, it's within acceptance. So you go, acceptance of what? Does anybody know how we get to AI? Do we know where AI starts? I believe it starts from the algorithms built by the programmer. So if I were to trust an AI, most, more than anything, I have to trust the person who's writing the algorithms. Uh, and yeah, but where do the algorithms come from? Yes. Where do the, they come from? Technically, they come from his, uh, his or her mind. What I intend to say, there's the ethical implications. Um, if I'm building an AI and I'm building certain algorithms around it, and I decide to define how a man looks, and I just define a man with bald hair, with, with bald head like me, mm -hmm. then if there's a man with hair, then the AI will not no, be capable you have to of it. understanding. No, train it, what yes. to look for. But it so, goes deeper than that. There's one level before that machine learning stage, okay, that most people don't, I didn't know, before I started studying eight years ago. There's actually a deep learning. So people heard of deep learning? Okay, so the deep learning phase is closest to our neural network, to our brains. Okay, and that is the deep stage that we cannot explain. The black box, you've all heard the black box problem? That starts in the deep learning stage because to get from A to B, we put all the data in and go, how do we get to this answer? And the neural net works it out. It is too complex at this moment in time for us to explain in human terms, for transparency, what it exactly does. Then, when we get the answers from that within the parameters of acceptability, then we build the algorithmic model based on what we think. You know, if we want to train cats and dogs, we have to train the difference between what a cat and dog looks like. Train the machine learning model to do that, run it in the wild so that it can see that we're definitely getting that acceptance uh, at least to a percentage level, so 80%, depends who sets it. 
could be as low as 70% acceptance that it will get it right most of the time. Then what that does is kick up into um, amalgamated into AI. So then artificial intelligence is told, this is a dog, this is a cat. Right, now learn some more nuanced differences. It has this capacity to learn, okay? So therefore, in terms of trustworthiness, it's very different from this side, from what you talked about, how you build up friendships. And it's very different for the computer scientists. And we're starting to teach them how to look at, like, what are ethical questions? You don't have to be a philosopher. Just in business terms, what are the risks of this going really wrong to unintended consequences? And we've seen some of them that have come up in COVID, the misinformation, the fake information. This can come from algorithms that haven't done some serious thinking up front. Now, how much percentage do you think, on average in general, um, is a split between male and female machine learning engineers? How much do you think? Um, yeah, more or less, a little bit higher, probably about 80, 20 still, there are more coming, um, and we're pushing them through. But it's still that lack of diversity that we find that comes out, say, um, everybody got Alexa? Google Alexa? Um, sorry, Amazon Alexa. Or equivalents. Um, yeah, so, so if, a, if a young girl, happened in the UK, was asking, when is the World Cup on, football-wise, sorry, I'm a football fan, I'm English, okay. Um, they meant the female World Cup. Uh, Alexa said no. There is no World Cup. Because it lacked this diversity, thinking about, you know, what do we mean, trustworthiness? Why can we ask these diverse questions up front? And if you attend Trisha's session later, she'll delve more into these sort of areas. So this is the thing. How do we build trust? Human building of trust, acceptance within a model of trust around your algorithms, which can go wrong, which are also, as I pointed out with computer scientists, if you have the lived experience of being a white, male, well-educated, privileged person, what are you going to build? You're not going to be diverse, and we'll get into... Anybody re read Carolina Perez's book on the data gender gap? Hmm? Now, one of the ladies micing me up remarked that I was much taller than her, and I said, well, yeah, but you see, most things are built on my average height, but heavier for a male. If anybody is shorter than that gets in a car, ever had a problem with your seatbelt? Ladies, doesn't really fit, rubs on your shoulders, not quite good. That's because it's not built for you, and you're actually 47% more likely to actually die in a car crash. Thank you, designers. Okay, that's just one example. There's also worse ones than that. So when we're talking about trust, we're just starting to unpack this and start to look and go, we're not thinking diversely enough up front. So this is why it takes a long time to build, but once you start to unpack it and realize we can't get full transparency, Therefore, we don't fully understand how he works over there. But yet, it is our own life. Um, there's a great professor, Floridi, at Oxford, who talks about we are in the era of on life. Yes, he's in our generation, but as we discussed before, we feel about 20 inside. <laughs> well, I do anyway. Um, but we're aging. But there's not that much nuanced differences between you all. I mean, between my partner and myself, we've got kids from 34, say kids, 34 to 20. And they keep us you know, lined up with what's happening in the world, trust me. Because my son often says, how many degrees have you got? And you do that? And I go, yeah, OK. So this is what I'm saying. Three different levels before we actually get to our artificial intelligence. And what we really lacked is understanding who's making these decisions. As I was told by one senior scientist, you do the pink and fluffy stuff, don't you? All this kind of behavioral stuff. I went, but you're actually enacting on behavior and shaping it. Don't you think you should be asking some questions? We've moved on a bit from there, thank goodness. So this is, this is a good one, okay. It was, this comes from good old Ada Lovelace. People have heard of Ada Lovelace? We had an Ada Lovelace day. Maybe not so much out of the UK, but a female who was one of the first computer scientists. And this is one of her things, garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you just keep chucking more data into your test bed that you're actually checking the machine learning tool to identify cat or dog or whatever you want it to look at, then you just stir the pot. This still happens predominantly. This is why we get mistakes. This is why credit scoring is way out of date. So I look at fintech, you'll see, on, if you love a look at my profile, I look at financial inclusion because around finance and fintech because they're using algorithms that are looking at 
out of date. You know, they're re-automating inequality. And what is the person like, that we should give credit to? Now, if you think about the LGBT framework, that's not the data it's been fed. It's not saying that if you're a trans person, how do you prove that and get a mortgage? I've got a colleague who's going through that very problem at the moment. It's not set up for that. It just goes, no. The famous comedian sketch in the UK, if you haven't seen it. But also trust has been bandied around today. And how do we build it? It's very subjective, is it not? Again, if I did a quick survey, how do you define trust? you would all come up with slightly different because of your background, your peers, etc. But it is the currency of innovation because if you don't trust the people who are doing it, then it's, you're not going to take up that tech. But why do most people use TikTok? Who told you to use TikTok? Friends? Sister? Family? So you go, OK, I trust that person that this is not going to cause me a wrong. I'm going to be fine using it. My data is going to be safe. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So you try. Your friends try. Oh, it must be okay, right? And we're we're in our comfy zone. I think, as the guy said in one of the early ones, when humans are comfortable, we like it. We don't like VUCA. We don't like uncertainty. I mean, how did most of us feel during COVID? Felt uncertain. We didn't know what was going to happen. Um, like two members of my family were shielding, so I was terrified to go anywhere near anybody else in case I took it back in the home. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. We don't like discomfort. What we like is to know that we're safe in our little environment with our friends and family. So trust is the currency of innovation. I nicked that from MasterCard, so I'm going to say it because I just published a report on it. So again, if we think about machine learning and the predominant use of it, how much is it in our society? I focus on the finance industry here because that's my area. But if you think about it, if you didn't have a plastic card now in your wallet and you could not go along and tap and pay for your coffee or whatever you want to get, you didn't have access to a basic bank account because the machine learning says no, you don't conform to what we've been trained to look for. You can't even enter into most other spheres of life, can you? Into the complex system that everything else comes out of. You're barred from that. And I've been speaking to charities, etc., to ask, you know, what is the key thing around this? And it's proving your identity to these companies, digital identity. So in the UK, that's usually driving license, passport, and one utility bill to show you can pay electricity bills. Now, if you're a migrant, say, coming from Ukraine, or even I've had colleagues in the university who've transferred from, say, Romania into the UK, they might be earning you know, a five, six-figure salary, but they can't get credit because the machine learning has said, no, no, you have to be able to come up with these three credentials to actually make sure that I'm a lender. So this is where machine learning is having this, you know, perhaps slightly covert effect on our lives. And again, the age of tech. So people coin this term, it's the new oil. And this is the reason. Like if you look at the old um, incumbents, oil, gas and energy, who are now no longer popular because of COP27 that's going on uh, two, two hours on a plane from here. So this... This image on the other side is about surfs, right? This was coined by a guy called Don Tapshot. If you want to check him out, he does blockchain research in Canada. But he just mentioned this the other day on a LinkedIn report, and I liked it. So he said, rather than surfing the internet, we've now become surfs to the internet. Like, we're working away. Everything we do is tagged, like your private life. Everything you put on the internet, I always think... Who's going to actually have access to that or use it for something? Even like filling in for a loan or something or filling out a report for a student. You know, as academics, we're asked to comment on other people's papers. Can they then find out that it's definitely us that's given them a really bad rating or a really good one? We just don't know. So we become like serfs. And I would recommend Susanna Zuboff's work on surveillance capitalism for opening your mind. So I think before we would say, what? What do we need to get out of this? I would say be curious creatures. That's what led me into academia, to be curious and go, why? What if I do that? And we do that as children, right? We like to play, you know, parents go, don't touch that. And you go, you see it, right? Humans are like that. So these guys are making huge amounts of money. And I think there was a clip before that Alex played with Zuckerberg sticking on the panel. What happened to him after that? Was he responsible? Was he accountable for then anything? I don't think he was. He wasn't held accountable. And we're talking about power. But where does power rest? I think it's pretty obvious where it rests right now. The people who own and run the internet. This will go on the internet, and people will start analyzing it and hashtagging it. 
And, and this is where we've got the problem of trust, etc. So we talk about harms. So this is, a, this is a key term that's coming out. Maybe not in your world, but in, a, in my world in academia. It's thinking about agency. So before we were woke, we had agency, right? Okay, so the freedom to choose, to think about what we wanted to do and what we wanted to commit to. But in this world of being serfs to the internet, you know, we're actually the serfs and the masters are elsewhere, or the puppet masters, as Zuboff says. We need to think about, you know, what is the undue influence? I think Athena's research pointed that out really well. So industry standards, who's got the vested industry standards there? And, you know, are, are GAFA, et cetera, working within regional and national law? I don't think they are. They're not really held to account responsibility for what they put out there. And does it do us harm or wrong us? I mean, we like say, we hear the terms like AI for good. Let's make sure we do tech for good. But why do we go, OK, tech, but not bad? We don't want it to do bad things. We want to really think through these questions a priori at the outset, the antecedents, so that we're, we want our future generations, not just us, future generations, to be happy and content, but also safe. Because that's what we demand. And I think, as I mentioned earlier when I was asking questions, it's very easy to go, I know what I must do. As I gave the example of being fit and healthy, we go to the gym, we eat right, and then we go and stuff ourselves with biscuits and all the nice stuff at lunchtime, and then go, right, I must hit the gym later. Therefore, making change culturally is really, really hard. Who's ever been in an organization that go, we're going to have a cultural program and we're going to change the way we do everything? And how many times have you got the email and gone, delete, because nothing's going to change? Why? Because it's not in my interest to do so. And if they don't get that appeal, that intrinsic appeal, like, why must I change? And I like to say, I go to the gym every January. I hate it because it's packed. There's loads of people on the treadmills. By March, I'm really happy because they've all given up. And this is things around responsibility to do with AI and looking at all these. And it's not just our generations. I'm like in the middle generation where I'm paying for care for my mother because she's got dementia. She's really vulnerable to all this. You know, she's one of the people who has money to invest, but it could easily go. We hear scams all the time, and they're getting smarter because they're, they're clones of the official companies, banks, etc., cetera, um, councils or bodies, governments even, and they're falling foul of this quite easily. So we need to think about how we do it. And whose responsibility is it anyway? Well, I would say it's all our responsibility because if we're talking about power, we have levels of power, right? We have monopolies of power. So if you think governments, I mean, would you vote Trump back in? I certainly wouldn't. But do I have power, real power, to, to influence that? Even if I was American? I have a vote, but it's one vote out of millions. Okay? And so the, you've got the monopolizers there. You've got the mass community at the bottom that these people serve. And in the middle, you've got people like us who are more privileged, who we could call corporate rationalizers, who could try and change this. But there's also limited outlets for you to do that. So we need to think broader and think, how do we do this? How do we all hold people to account? We've had corporate social responsibility, which has been a nice tick box. That's the other thing humans like to go, yeah, done that, tick, done that, tick. But are they really doing it? With autisticity, or is it what our brains want to do, get from A to B as quickly as possible with too much hassle, but go, look what I've done. I, I've met that standard. I've got a certificate to prove it. So this is one of the things we've got to look at. Right across the board, cutting across. This is what I like to do with complex system. This is a complex adaptive system. If we've got to think about all of this, all together, blows your mind, right? Can one person do this? Can one person keep a handle on how it changes on a daily basis? I think this conference so far has established that we can't because it is a meandering, fluid process. People are entering these niches of technological change, financial, health. I mean, um, I haven't got my tracker on today because it's gone for a service. But otherwise, it would be tracking. It would tell me I was in Malta. It would tell me I could go to restaurants up here. My phone does, you know. Start, how many times do you start talking about something and suddenly your phone goes up? Ooh, look, there's a health center down the road. There's a healthy juice bar you can go and visit. And my partner's going, is this what you're talking about? Is this the algorithm stuff? And I went, yes, it's listening to you right now. So these are what we need to think about. And how do we do that? This is one mechanism. Corporate digital responsibility, and it's got a manifesto. Woo. 
Okay, so this is a nice badge you can stick on your organization, and um, Trish might talk a bit about more before, because we're part of an organization. I started thinking about this about two and a half years ago. So I was sat on a, on a Turing, so Alan Turing Institute forum like this, and I was saying, you know, corporate sociability is just not doing it for me. Nobody is really... Social is not the same as digital. It has a social impact, whereas this goes across the social, the economic, and also the environmental. Like, what are we doing across that, that supply chain from beginning with the engineers, the thought processes, uh, to a company's responsibility to think, large or small, what am I doing with data and digital technologies within, but also by my organization? Because who uses, who's ever accessed open source data? and used it for maybe development, well, yeah. Okay, did you really question where it was from or check its hereditary, where it came from, authenticity? You did. Yeah, it's problematic, because usually you find it's a guy in a room who's, who's keeping this open source data going by himself. It doesn't really scale well. And then also people talk about blockchain, which we will hear about in this conference. Blockchain is the panacea, you know, really good, emerged out of the whole Bitcoin. I've been looking at it for eight years, and still it gets problems. Alex and I were at a conference with Athena, and um, Josh should be speaking about blockchain. And there's problems with that. Once you start to scale it, okay, the good things, so people know about the benefits of blockchain. Maybe, well, Harold did. It's immutable, okay? Immutability means you cannot change it. So once you enter a transaction, say it's a, it's a transaction between you and I, it creates a unique encrypted code, goes onto the blockchain, the rest of the group approve that that's taking place, it goes onto the block, can't be moved. So it's immutable, right? So you can't go back. So it's great for auditing, but it's incredibly slow compared to like Visa, Bax payments, Swift, etc. So then if you think, if we go, okay, it's the panacea for everything to record, to make it transparent, to get that transparency that we need and talk about, but if we scale it up, what's going to happen to transaction speed? Who's going to be the custodian of it? Who's going to make sure that nobody tweaks with it or some clever computer scientist comes up with a way to break the encryption? You know, the, these are things, but when you start to scale it, you have to section it up, which loses immutability, which is the key thing that we want. So there's pros and cons, but there are lots of people, I'm sure Rachel will talk about, about how it could be an answer, but there's still question marks about technology. But these principles here, purpose and trust, not profit, okay? Purpose and trust, because you can still make a profit whilst being purpose-driven. So most people in the room here, I would agree, we don't want to do bad things. We want to use tech that actually enhances life and makes things more inclusive. So I also champion around data poverty. Because like I say, we are privileged. We can all access TikTok and things. But I've been working with people who can't. Because there's a hashtag in the UK at the moment, eat or heat. Um, that doesn't mean eat, heat or use TikTok. No, we can't even afford to get a connection or a device. So we re appropriating devices from big companies. But that's just a small bit we need to do on a big scale. Then fair and equitable access for all, that's again feeding into that. Why shouldn't people be able to access it? And also, not just access from being signed up, but if you've not been educated, if you've not had a chance to think about digital, how will you get those digital skills? They're very different from social media digital skills, digital skills that can actually get you into the world to use a fintech app. Who's ever accessed their banking app or a fintech app and gone, oh, what? I'm not quite sure what I'm signing up to here. Not sure what it's going to do with my money. Anyone? Yeah. So, I mean, if you're like that, imagine if you have no idea about how the financial system works because you've just not been privy to it. So there's a whole movement as well that we need to have it accessible. So the app development itself is accessible. There's a new consumer duty just come into the UK to say everything that you communicate in financial services and fintech has to be understandable across all people, including vulnerable groups. As someone crudely put to me, that means we have to make it understandable by a 10-year-old. I went, that's very crude. I think we need to think a little bit more out of the box. So again, societal well-being. Um, you, can, you can catch up on these. You can go on the corporate digital responsibility.net if you want to join. It's across the world now. People are pushing this. But again, it falls foul. The people will tick box it. That's always part of human society. So thank you for listening. If you want to catch me, I'm at the University of Birmingham. Um, I do a lot of work around trust, promoting societal and corporate digital responsibility.